Good morning, folks. Jason Kennel with Concrete Floor Solutions. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a small metallic floor, about 90 square feet. Um, this is actually in a basement area. The floor has been ground and prepped already. There is a crack that I'm going to show you how we're going to repair. Uh, and then today, we're going to get the black primer down afterwards. Tomorrow, we're going to do the metallics. Um, one thing I did want to mention about metallics, you know, there, there's a lot of I'll say mystery with the metallics because there is no set installation technique. Uh, metallics are designed to be put down thick. So you almost like puddle them on the floor and depending how you pull the puddles around with your rollers or squeegees or magic trowels, you create different designs in the floor. So I can't necessarily say how you have to install it. It's however you want to install it. It gives you that freedom and that will give you whatever look you're, you're looking for. So we're going to start right off. I'm going to show you the area here. I'm going to show you the crack we're going to repair and get right into it. Okay, so again, this is a small area here, about 90 square feet. Uh, this is going to be a spare room in a basement. So the floor has been ground already. Um, you can see the exposed aggregate there. You might be able to see some scratch. Here's the crack. This is a small crack. It's about five feet long runs across the floor. So what we're going to do is we're going to repair this crack with the CFS 343 first, uh, allow that to cure. Then we're going to grind the surface of the crack that we just filled. And then we're going to put down our black primer today. Okay, folks, so we have our materials out here. We have uh, the CFS 343 part A and part B. This is a two gallon kit. So it's one gallon of part A and one gallon of part B. This is a ketchup bottle that I'm going to use to mix in. Um, and I prefer to get the ones that are already pre-marked. Um, you can get them without the markings and just mark lines. It has to be a one-to-one -one ratio. So what we're going to do is 50 milliliters of part A, 50 milliliters of part B for a total of 100 milliliters for this five-foot uh, five crack. So I'm going to show this how we mix it up on video now. Then I'm going to put the camera down close up so you can see me fill the crack. Okay, so mixing this material. Again, this is a, a fast set material, so I'm going to mix this on the board here just so you see it, and then I'm going to pull the board out of the way to fill the crack. So we're going to pour to 50 milliliters. Okay, that was my part A. 50 milliliters of part B. Okay. Now we're up to the line. Now I'm going to put this lid on. I have a couple little drips on the outside perimeter here, which I don't want to splash around. I'm going to put these caps on quick just because I have to pull this out of the way. Okay, so here is the material that I poured in the ketchup bottle. I'm going to shake it up about 10 times or so. And then I'm simply going to go over the crack and just drizzle this right down on it. And it's going to wick right inside the crack. That's what this is designed to do. So a little crack here, it might go off camera. But while I'm here, I'm just going to do it all. We're going to come right down the crack. And you see how thin this is. It wicks right inside here. So what you're trying to do is glue this crack back together again. But I do have to say, whenever you're repairing any crack for anybody, you can never guarantee that the crack won't reoccur. Because this crack goes up to a wall here, there's another room over here. So if I can't repair the whole crack, um, it could just come back out again. One thing I do want to show on this, I don't know if you can see, see where I stopped, well I actually started pouring here. The material wicked out an inch from where I poured it. This is a very, very thin wicking material. I'm going to set this up, keep it up on real time. Just so you can see how I do this. I'm going to go over this again now. I'm giving this just a couple seconds here to gel up. Now if you have a wider crack, you want to pre-fill these cracks with sand. Otherwise this material is just going to keep running out the bottom. Okay, so it drained down again. Let 
Another interesting area there is I poured the material there and you can see, I didn't even see this, there's a tiny little crack there that it's wicking, it's wicking into. So I'm just going to fill that right away too. Let that drain down there. So I'm just going to keep going over this crack probably three, four times, whatever, until it's full. Again, wider cracks you want to pre-fill with sand just so this stuff clots in there a little bit better. And I can feel in my hand this ketchup bottle is getting a little bit warm. Also, the great thing from a contractor standpoint, the great thing about this material is it sets so fast, you can repair these cracks, grind them in like 10 or 15 minutes and keep going with the floor so you don't have to waste time waiting for materials to set up. We use this on virtually every job we have, I'm going to say every day. I mean, this is, this is just a great material to have. Okay, so this is the third time going over. And now you can see it's starting to hold. Still draining down a little bit, but it's starting to hold, so we're getting close. This is all holding in full here, drain down a little bit here. That's all holding. So I just kind of keep watching the crack. We're all full. Drain down a little bit here. And I can feel my ketchup bottle starting to get a little bit warm. There's not much left in here. I mean, my goodness, we're down to virtually nothing at this point. But I just want to make sure this holds. And once it holds and sets, then it won't drain down anymore. I just want to keep this going real time just so you can actually see the working time on this material. Now, the warmer it is, right now it's probably about 60 in this basement. So, um, the warmer it is, the quicker this stuff sets. If it was 70, this probably would have set by now. So it's going to tack up real soon, so I'm just watching. I don't want to have to mix up another batch for an inch of crack, so I'm trying to watch closely here to make sure this stays full. Now there is another technique too. You can use a piece of cardboard. I'll actually show you how to do that. Let me grab a razor knife. Grab a piece of cardboard and you can almost use it like a squeegee and pull this puddle in the crack. Let me grab a razor knife. I know I just did this off camera, but I just cut a little square of cardboard. So now what I'm going to do is where this drains down a little bit. I'm just going to use this to pull a puddle and push it into the crack. Now, if you're doing like a lot of crack, it's kind of hard to keep up with this because this stuff sets so quick. But when you're doing a five foot crack, you can kind of take your time with it and watch it closer. I'm just pulling the puddle over the crack. I'm going to be grinding over the face of this crack with my Hilti DG150. And I have that right in the other room here. So I'll do this. We're going to let it set in 10 minutes. And then I'll grind it. I'll show you how we do that. Okay, this material is set up now. So I have my uh, Hilti DG150. I'm going to fire up the vacuum. Obviously it's going to be loud while I do this.
So that's what it looks like after we grind it. So now the crack is totally full. You can see where it is for like polishing contractors. That's what's going to remain after you polish the concrete. It's full, but you'll still see the crack. So I'm going to vacuum this out, and then we're going to get ready to put down the primer. Okay, so we are set here to put our primer down. We are going to be applying the CFS 707 LVP black, which is what you typically do for metallics, depending what colors you're using, but that's the most common color by all means. So I'm going to get this set up. We'll mix up the material and apply it. Okay, from a tool standpoint, I have my spike shoes ready. In this particular case, I have a 16-inch squeegee. I have a 9-inch roller, which normally I always recommend an 18-inch roller, but this area is so small, it surely doesn't justify an 18-inch roller. We always use the Wooster Epoxy Glide Rollers. Those are quarter-inch nap, uh, and those work the best. There's no lint on them. Uh, I have a cheap brush, and of course my mixing paddle to mix. So I'll put this on the tripod, mix this up, get this out. Here we go. I'm going to run through the whole process so you can see how we mix this. We have our part A. We have our part B. I always use a uh, an awl to pop these little tabs off. Um, you can use a little screwdriver if you have to also. That's just for shipping so nothing pops off. This is a two to one ratio. So right now I'm pouring the part A into the uh, bucket. I just want to make sure everything drains out of the bucket well. I'll normally hold it there 10 seconds or so just to get the bulk of it out. Okay. Part B is thinner than part A, so we pour part B in there. I don't know if you can really see this on camera, but I always put part B inside of part A when I'm done, just to kind of conserve on space here. And well, it wasn't supposed to happen on camera, but put that lid on there. Okay, so now we're good. I also always have some paper towels out. God forbid you spill something, you can at least clean it up easily. I'm going to take my drill, put this on low speed. I'm going to mix this approximately one or two minutes. As you can see, I'm going around in circles. It's very important that you get these edges really, really well. If ever you're going to have an error mixing epoxy, that's when you're going to get it. Somebody doesn't mix the edges well. that bottom corner good. I can't stress that enough. Okay, once I have it mixed, I pull the mixing paddle out. I'll speed my drill up slowly. Just to spin off the extra material so it's not flying all over the place. And then I'll leave that lay right on the cardboard. So now I have my material mixed. I'm gonna step out, I'll put my spike shoes on and start applying. I need to move the camera. I'm gonna put my spike shoes on. Now, I mixed up a gallon and a half of material. You normally get about 200 square feet per gallon. I have about 90 square feet here. So this is probably only going to take about half or three quarters of a gallon. So I don't want to over pour too much here. So I'm going to pour one stripe like that. You have to be very careful leaving epoxy in a bucket because if you leave it in a bucket, it generates heat and it sets up much quicker. That's what they refer to as the pot life. So, uh, Anything to slow it down helps. Pouring it out on the floor, it disperses the uh, 
the volume so it sets slower and it extends the uh, pot life. I'm just going to pull this around with the squeegee and make sure we have this where I can see it penetrate right into the concrete here, which is good. That's what you want. Now I'm doing this before the walls are up. You can do it before the walls are up, after the walls are up. You just have to be careful if you do it before the walls are up so uh, you don't damage it during construction. In this particular case, it's just some drywall that's going to go up. This is going to be a storage area. What's nice about doing this, you don't really have to pay too much attention to the edges. Since they're putting drywall up after, you can kind of slap up the edges with the roller and it won't affect anything. Okay, I'm going to pour a little more material out. Remember I was saying you don't want to over pour material. The last thing you want to do is have a big puddle at the end uh, because then you can't get rid of it. And it should be plenty to finish this. So I'm holding the bucket like this. I'm going to set it back out on the cardboard. You can't see me over in the corner here. By the way, hopefully people like this lapel mic. I bought a new uh, Bluetooth mic. I know I had a lot of people referencing that I should get a Bluetooth mic. And I, I knew that for years, actually, except I never seemed to find one that worked well or was easy to use. And this one, so far, I tested it a little bit before I shot this video, obviously. And uh, sound quality seems to be okay. So you tell me if this sounds better than what it used to sound like, because before, I know it was the camera and I was far away and the volume was always up and down. It was very hard to deal with. All right, so I have a puddle right here. So now, I hope you can see this. I'm rolling my roller into the puddle to wet the roller up. You always need to roll into a puddle. Now my roller is wet up, I will continue squeegeeing, close this up here, and then I will back roll everything, and that is it for the day. So the point of this black primer is you want to seal all the little holes in the floor, so when you put your metallic on it, you don't get bubbles in the metallic. So it's one thing since you're, you're puddling the metallics on here. Um, if you get air bubbles in, it's very visible, and then you have to sand them afterwards, and this eliminates the sanding if you get the primer on really good. Okay, so I have the primer down good. Get my squeegee out of here. Let's see if I can get this over here without making a mess. Okay. Now... going to begin my rolling process. So I'm just going to do the edges first. And I might fast forward this a little bit for some of the boring parts. I like to keep this real time so you see exactly how long things take or should take as, as you do this. I figure you have a fast forward button on your YouTube channel there. If you get bored watching me do this, you can fast forward. Now again, I'm just dragging the 9 inch roller right up against this edge. The drywall is going to be at least a half inch thick plus the trim. So by doing this, you don't really have to worry about edges at all. It kind of takes care of itself. The only thing I'm going to have is the corners, and I'm just going to take a uh, brush and get the corners a little closer. I'm just trying to pay attention to detail here. Get that leading edge. And that corner's already good. This corner is good. Okay. All right, now I'm going to roll 
perpendicular from the way I just squeegeed. Paying particular attention to, to coat any holes. If you see any holes, you want to kind of work it in there a little bit better. Again, this is designed to seal the floor so you don't get any air bubbles in your metallics. Yeah, the black just kind of shows off the metallics a little bit better when you put the uh, metallics on top of this. Okay, there's half. And here's the advantage of spiked shoes. You can walk in what you just back rolled. And it really doesn't leave any marks at all. Okay. Everything looks good. That's it. I'm going to step out, clean up, and I'm done. Hopefully I don't fall on camera here. Pull my spike shoes off. See, I'm sporting my Merrells that I normally, I surely don't wear these on a commercial job site. But when you're working in a basement like this, it's kind of convenient. Okay, and again, people were asking, how do you clean tools? I'm going to show you right now. So I have two surgical gloves, rubber gloves, latex gloves, nitrile, whatever you want to use here. Now, the only thing I'm able to clean out of all of this is the squeegee. So the roller, this is disposable. There's no way to clean this thing. So you knock the roller off. Roller pops off. I'll take a uh, paper towel. I just kind of clean these ends up because I'm going to reuse this tomorrow. That's the roller. Uh, the actual squeegee itself. We use acetone. The acetone right there. And what I'm going to do is wipe the bulk of the black off with a paper towel. Do it again, and then use another paper towel. Put some acetone on the paper towel. Wipe across the whole blade. Make sure there's no film left. And that's it. And I'm done for the day. I'm gonna leave all this set right where it is on the plastic, or on the uh, cardboard. So it's in a safe area, so I'm not dripping anywhere across the basement. And uh, then tomorrow morning, this stuff will be hard, and I can pick everything up and not worry about tracking stuff through somebody's house. So that's it for the day. We'll be back tomorrow. I'll show you how to do the metallics. Okay, so now we're back. It's actually about 12 or 13 hours later after I put the primer down, same day. But the primer is, is set up. It's dry to the touch. So now we're able to put on our next coat. So I'm going to go back to the camera. I'll show you what we have here. I'm going to show you how we're going to mix up the 671 metallic and go from there. Okay, so this is the black primer for the metallics. This is the CFS 707 LVP. Now, I always say this with the primers. They penetrate in sometimes. You can see it's a little patchy. It's soaked into the concrete, which is why you use a primer. So this whole surface is sealed now really well. I don't know if you can see that. But it's all black. There's no holes in it. It's sealed. So now I'm going to mix up the uh, 671. We're going to pour it out on top of this and I'll show you how to do that. Okay. So now we have our 671. I don't know if you can see that. Our 671 binder. This is specifically meant for metallics. So you, you can use it with other um, either quartz or flake. Or you can use it with other materials. But this is designed for the metallics. So this is clear. And then I have two pigments that I'm going to be putting into this um, clear coat. So we're going to be putting the Azure and the Whale. So I have two colors. So what I'm going to do is mix up this gallon and a half of clear in this bucket. I'm going to pour a little bit in here and the rest in here. So I'm going to mix the Whale in here. That's going to be my main color. And then my accent color, I'm going to put 
in this tub here and mix that separately. And that's going to be this azure. So that's what we're going to do. So I'll show you. So first thing I'm going to do is pour my material into this five gallon bucket here. And this is a two to one ratio. So we have one gallon of part A to a half gallon of part B. There's the part A. Here's the part B. Okay. All right, now I'm going to thoroughly mix this before I put the pigment in. You always mix epoxies before you add anything to it. So I'm going to mix this. Just like the primer, paying attention to the edges. I don't know if you can see that well. I'm trying not to mix this real fast. I don't want to whip air into it and make it like a frothy mess. Although the air will escape from this. my paddle. Now what I'm going to do is pour some of this into this secondary container here. This is going to be my accent color. So I'm only going to need a little bit of that. So that's going to be my accent color. Now this is my whale. This is going to be my main color. So I'm going to pour this whole thing into the bucket. that I'm going slow with the uh, paddle because this this is so fine it turns into like dust so until it gets absorbed in there you just want to go slow so you're just distributing that metallic throughout the uh, clear other one, what I'm going to do is I'm only going to pour a little bit. This is actually for a gallon and a half. And this, this is with the, the flexibility that you get with these metallics. So this is for a gallon and a half. I'm only mixing, God, a quart. So I'm just going to do that much, which is plenty for what I'm doing there. Because again, this is just the accent color. And then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a stirring stick. I'm going to do this one by hand. And I'm just going to get that stirred in there just to get the metallics in. These powders are so fine. They, they become airborne if you go too quickly. So it seems like it's all in there now. I'm just going to make sure it's all stirred in good. Okay. There's our accent color. Okay. So I'm going to walk out there. I'm going to show you how we do this. Okay, so now we're getting ready to pour this on the floor. Now, there's a couple different things you can do. Again, the flexibility with metallics. Um, you can use a magic trowel, uh, which I'm not going to use this today. What I'm actually going to do is pull it around with my squeegee and my 9-inch roller, just because this is a small area and it's easy to do. Putting my spikes on. You always want your spikes. 
So now what I'm going to do is just pour this, pour this across the floor. I'm going to try to do even ribbons here. squeegee and push this around. Whatever rhyme or rhythm you want here. And the flexibility with these metallics is great. Whatever you want to do, look at it like artwork. Whatever you want to do with it, with your canvas, you can create whatever you want. So the bottom line is you just need your whole floor wet with the metallics. Now, if this was a larger area, I would definitely squeegee this like in a pattern. And then after I get it squeegeed out, you can go in random patterns to push it around. When you push it around, this is what creates like the the swirl effect and the other type of effects just by how you push these puddles around. This whale is a pretty color. It's probably the most popular color we sell. I'm going to wet my roller up in a puddle here before I go too far. I actually should have done this a little bit earlier. Okay, roller's wet up. So yeah, this material, you have to push like puddles around. You can't put this down thin. It's not designed for thin. You want minimum 100 square feet per gallon. If you go a little heavier, it surely will not hurt. Okay. Now we got that. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a quick back roll here just to kind of get everything even. I still need to add my accent colors. A lot of people are afraid of metallics just because of the unknowns. And it, it's just because you can do so many things with it in so many different ways. Um, just people aren't familiar with the flexibility of it. This is actually a great material to work with. You just simply puddle it on the floor move it around like kind of create designs in it when you move it around and then when it sets up you get these beautiful designs and patterns in it okay get the edge good i'm just going to quickly do the body of the floor here just trying to level everything off But it's important that you push a puddle because this has to self-level. After you get done doing whatever you're doing, you want it to self-level so it's nice and smooth when you're done. Otherwise, you're going to see, you know, ripples where it goes from thin to thick material. Okay. Now I have everything rolled out. Now this is pretty much a very consistent pattern which again, we're not looking for patterns. So I'm gonna pour the accent color out there and then I'm gonna go in random patterns just to move things around. So I'm gonna kind of go like a little diagonal here. Go there.
Okay, that's all I'm going to do. I'm actually leaving a little bit left in this bucket. All right, now I am going to take my roller and I'm kind of randomly kind of go over this. Now I'm specifically not going in uniform patterns because I'm trying to move this around randomly here. Basically I'm pushing puddles around. That's, that's what I'm doing. Pushing puddles around. squeegee out of here. I'm going to put a little blue out here just because I have a little bit left. There's a little light there. Okay. All right, now I'm just doing a quick front and back. Just to kind of level this off here. So I'm going to work my way out the door here. So. I'm trying to show you how I work my way out of here. This is interesting holding the camera and rolling at the same time. That's it. So I'm going to let that self level and let it set up and then we're good. Okay, folks, it's been about 72 hours. I let this cure really well. Um, I'm going to bring the camera out here, show you in detail what we have, and then we're going to talk about the optional clear coat you could put on top. Okay, so here we are. This turned out really, really nice. Now, if you look real, real close, there's a couple tiny little dimple kind of things that you get. Um, it happens. Um, so what I'm going to do, uh, you, you can either leave it like this. I mean, if, if you're okay with a couple little dimple things, or you can sand the floor lightly and do another clear coat. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a optional uh, urethane, polyurethane clear coat on this. It's the CFS 356. Um, so what I'm going to do is sand this lightly. I'll show you how to do that and then roll the 356 on top and that should take care of those little dimples. Okay, so what I'm using for this, again, this is like 90 square feet. I'm using, uh, it's a drywall sander with 220 grit sandpaper. So all I'm going to do is just real lightly, it doesn't have to be hard, I'm just going to go over the floor and wherever I see those dimples too, especially, I'm just going to make sure they're sanded down and... Just get a little scratch on the floor so when I put my urethane on here, it has something mechanically to bite on. So you always want a mechanical bond, if at all possible. Okay, so the material we are using today for the clear coat is the CFS 356. So this is a single component material. I'm going to pour it in a bucket, dip it on, and roll it, or dip it in the bucket and roll it on. Okay, I poured about a half a gallon in there. It's kind of hard to see. I'm going to dip into that and roll that on the floor. 
Okay, so here we go. Now, I'm getting ready to put this down. I do have a respirator with chemical filters on it. The polyurethanes do smell really bad. So I'm going to put this on. And you go. So I am putting my spiked shoes on. You don't necessarily need to do this for the top coat, but you got to be careful. You don't want to step in it. So I have my, my 9-inch uh, um, epoxy glide roller on here. Quarter-inch nap. Here's my bucket of urethane. Ooh, it's very slippery out here. All right, I'm going to put my respirator on. That is it. Okay, folks, there you have it. Clear coat installed. I'm going to stay off this for three days, and then um, I can open it to full traffic. Okay, folks, here we are 72 hours later. You can see the high reflection in the light there. And that is your finished product. Here you have it. That is the metallic floor. Very easy to install. Please don't be intimidated by these materials. It's very easy to install. The rules are simple. Just puddle it, push it around with the roller, squeegee, whatever you have to do. It creates its own designs. I'm going to have links below for the materials. If you have any questions at all, please look me up. If you like what you're watching, please hit the like button and please subscribe. Thank you.